All right, everybody. So we have Steve Hall here today. Unfortunately, my intro is never going to be as good as his because I don't have the British accent to go with it. <laughs> um, so you're a podcaster yourself, and you've been doing this for a while. I think I just saw a, a great opportunity for you on your Instagram. You had a opportunity to be a, a Red Tea Detox Affiliate Ambassador, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, what was it? They said something like, oh, I'm so happy to be able to present you with this opportunity. We don't yeah. think it's everyone only to channels with over 10,000 subscribers, which is awesome that we're over 10,000 subscribers. That's the yeah. great part, not the <laughs> affiliate with the... Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so uh, so we have, you know, somewhat parallel stories. Um, you know, we've both been at this for a long time. We both like the evidence-based approach. And I wanted to get you on here because people see you, you know, on the other side of this most of the time, but some people don't really know your story. Um, and so, you know, feel free to rant. I kind of wanted to just get the Steve Hall story of you know, how you got into this, the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak about it. And like I said to you off air, for some reason, people seem to get some value from it, whether it's motivation. I think people have been through similar hardships or even kind of various aspects of my ill health. They've kind of suffered themselves because it was all kind of a bit weird. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I can, I don't know where you want me to start from kind of just what was the, accident. I mean, you can start from, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I know you had some physical activity before that, but I think that really set you back, right? Yeah, completely. I mean, the accident changed my life. It completely changed where I was going. I, not that I really knew at the time when you're at university and I, I wasn't sure where I was going to go with it. Uh, but I'd always been into training, well, not into training, but into being active. I've always enjoyed that element of things. Uh, but never really taking it that seriously. I didn't do like art A levels. I didn't do kind of PE or anything like that. Um, and I didn't go to university and study kind of anything related to exercise science or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it always been like a big part, like a big hobby of mine. And I kind of dabbled with weights and running and endurance sports, and things like that. And this is kind of probably what led to my downfall in that I was, uh, and I'd always been a little bit obsessed about it as well. So I was yeah. on what was a traditional like 10 kilometer run for me. I had my whole Garmin watch and like a uh, waist, what's it called the heart rate monitor and everything, yeah, yeah. which is always a pain in the ass. I haven't worn one of those in ages. And uh, I had, I could see I was on for like an all time PB on this run, um, which was not great because I ended up coming to some traffic lights and they were flashing Amber. So I just, I went for it. I didn't look and when I did look, there was a big old white van um, that hit me on on the side. And I had some short term, pretty bad things in that. I think I had a short term concussion. Um, I uh, fractured my skull, had scarring down my back and on my elbow. i um, still got some of the I can't quite show the scars, but uh, I forget they're there. And people are like, what the hell's that? And then I'm like, ah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> opening for my long story. So there were some short term things and they really weren't very bad. I, I can't even remember any pain from it, anything like that. I smashed his windscreen with my head and that head injury is kind of where everything kind of shit hit the fan effectively because yeah. uh, I never, re I always took for granted how important kind of your head is and people talk about wearing a helmet when you're cycling and mm -hmm. kind of when you're doing certain activities and I always, you always kind of go, eh, like it's just your head, but right. it's not until you actually hit that area, you realize that the brain literally controls every single little thing and if you damage it in any sort of way, it has trickle down effects to every single part of your body. And this is really where I learned that because I'm not completely sure what happened and nor are the doctors. And I mean, they were so not sure that after I think I was in hospital for two days and I was released and then uh, I went home and I ended up uh, puking and I basically had like a mini kind of panic attack. And I, it was a really, really horrible time. And I went to A&E and then I was in hospital for close to a month after that. So it obviously wasn't obvious that anything had particularly gone wrong apart from all the, the fractures and the kind of scarring. But they think I damaged or I bruised my pituitary yeah. um, because they believe it healed, which makes sense because a lot of the uh, effects that that caused have repaired now. So I'm really happy to tell all the listeners uh, that I'm fully recovered from it, or as right. far okay. as I know I am. There might be some small kind of effects that have kind of come along with it, which I can touch on. Um, but immediately what was the concern was, and why I couldn't be released is because I forget the term for it and I always mess up the saying for it, but I basically had very low sodium levels. 
and people know about electrolytes and kind of the balance there and people know about cramping and like edema and these sort of things um, and basically when you have very low sodium levels you could be at risk well people know you can kind of drown yourself with drinking too much sure. because my body had very low sodium levels it was kind of this sort of situation where I could have a seizure um, at kind of any moment because they were at such a low level I forget the actual wow. figures or anything but um, yeah, it was, I remember being in hospital for days and not going to the bathroom, like for like, a, a, I, it could have been a week. I'm not even sure, but yeah, um, wow. that meant I was on like water restrictions, uh, fluid restrictions and everything. And I just remember, um, even being in hospital and it was a struggle to get up, to go to the toilet and just walk around. And I remember like friends and family visiting and, I just was like dead in the eyes. My dad said for a long time I'd lost like the twinkle in my eye, which is a really weird wow. thing to think about. But he also How old were you at that point? Uh, so I was at university second year, 20 years old, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, second year. So yeah, it was kind of a bit of a, a scary time. Um, but eventually I was released as I was sustaining kind of steady low sodium levels. And I was on a uh, water restriction, which was 250 mils. Uh, per day was all I could drink, wow. uh, which I, I don't even know how I did it because right now, like I could down like a liter of water first thing in the yeah, morning. Yeah. I take it for granted. But then it was like, I couldn't have soup. I couldn't wow. have like cereal because there was milk and it was just like, I had to be so careful about what I was eating and consuming. Um, and for those in the US, that's about a, a cup of water a day. Oh yeah. I, yeah. yeah ounces <laughs> and cups. I always, yeah. yeah, I lose my mind with those. I'm like, eh? I don't understand what this is. Uh, wow, so, it's very limited. Yeah, it was barely anything. Um, and as you can imagine, when you're at university, drinking is quite a big deal. And this severely restricted me along with the fact that I just couldn't drink, but it wasn't like I was a normal person in that my energy levels, my concentration was really hampered with yeah. the, the accident. Just, I just was like, like my, my dad said, I lost my twinkle. I basically like felt like I literally had, I probably had brain damage of some sort there. And yeah. I just wasn't functioning my best. It was a really hard time. And along with being on that fluid restriction, I was also on like diuretics, which I was taking daily. And I don't know what side effects they could have had. I was, I honestly didn't really have the brain power to really even think about these sort of things that I would obviously think yeah. about now. And I look back and I'm kind of like, why didn't I even question that? Um, so I'd lost a lot of confidence, but I lost a lot of weight in hospital as well. Um, so I went in at about 11 stone, came out nine stone, or I lost like, um, 30 or 40 pounds mm -hmm. when I was in hospital. And obviously a lot of that's like fluid and food and, but I lost a lot of fat, but also muscle, the, the quickest right. way to lose muscle and like losing muscle is not that like easy really. Um, but if you're just not eating and you're not moving, that's a really easy way to lose it quickly. Yeah, so sure. I, I looked super skinny and I was not in a very good place mentally or physically. So I was really underconfident. I started kind of, I was like, I don't really want to run anymore because I, I just fell out of love with that completely. And this is where the gym came in because I kind of was like, I want to build myself up. I kind of, I was into the gym a little bit and I kind of heard people talk about like bulking and stuff. So mm -hmm. That's where I first started like digging into online forums, uh, trying to find advice, finding terrible advice uh, yeah. and applying it. And I remember when I was at university and this is I basically became like very in, like isolated. I didn't go out because I basically couldn't. And my kind of the only way I could fuel kind of getting through days was having this passion of bodybuilding and reading these forums and trying to do all these things. So I, I made myself a meal plan. I think it was like 350 grams of protein, something ludicrous yeah. considering my size. I was like 130 pounds. Yeah. Uh, and then I was on like almost 4,000 calories, which is crazy as well. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was looking to gain, literally, I can remember being upset if I didn't gain like half a stone a week. Jeez. <laughs> I was like, I'm eating all clean food, so I'm just going to gain clean weight. And like, it's, this is a clean bulk, not a dirty right. bulk. Right. That's how it works, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I gained so much weight in a short amount of time and I got all the way up to 190 pounds, uh, in less than a year. Like I gained it really, really quick. And I think there's probably a lot of rebound of, I was, I lost kind of 30 sure. pounds going into hospital. So a lot of it was just my body regaining that back, but I went way over that as well. Um, and I, I gained some muscle, but not that much. And I was still not in a good place. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was taking advice from 
kind of just big guys who kind of right. looked like they knew what they were saying. And this is where I then went, I went through a cut and I remember doing keto. And during this time, I kind of, I was slowly getting better and recovering from things. And I got to a point where I was recovered from the, um, the low sodium levels and I'd recovered that and I could control that. And I kind of discovered other issues in that I, it was probably a consequence of also gaining the weight and gaining body fat quite fast. I got um, lumps under my nipples, which I just didn't know what that was at the time. And yeah. so I went and got that checked out, um, being obviously worried it could have been cancer or something. And luckily it wasn't. It was gynecomastia, which probably a lot of your mm -hmm. audience have heard of, just like sure. man boobs, kind of. And yeah. uh, that's when I was prescribed testosterone replacement therapy because I was tested and they found my testosterone levels were kind of below the lowest range. They were out of normal ranges. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was given a gel, I think it was called like Testo gel. And this was okay. something I'd rub onto my chest um, to try and bring these levels up and balance out my testosterone to my estrogen levels. And so this worked great. It was unbelievable to be quite honest. Right. Um, whenever I see people talk about, oh, they've got terribly low testosterone, their doctor's saying that they maybe could go on kind of testosterone replacement therapy. I'm always like, well, why wouldn't you? Because it really hampers your life. Um, sure. Not only kind of the potential lumps on the nipples, but you'll have a higher prop propensity to gain body fat. Your energy levels are lower. Your libido, you don't have one. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't growing body hair. Um, so after I started taking it, the lumps started going. Um, my energy levels were way up. I started being able to grow body hair came on and I'd be able to like grow a beard. And it was all <laughs> massively exciting. And probably very fortunately to my advantage, at that time, I was also discovering more people like um, 3DMJ, 3D Muscle Journey, sure. uh, so Eric Helms and that sort of person. And uh, Matt Ogus was posting on YouTube at the time. He was someone I was following at that time. And I was finding good information. I started applying these and finding Lyle McDonald and applying his stuff at Alan Aragon. So I was becoming way more educated and the results were flying in because obviously I was also putting in uh, a better amount of testosterone. I was normalizing my levels, so I was getting better results via that. So Did you get your levels fun. checked? Uh, yeah, so I was getting them monitored uh, as I was doing it, and I managed to get up to... I never came out of normal range, okay. um, because I never took... You You can take quite a lot, but I never took that much. I kind of mm -hmm. um, had, like, a, one sachet. I can't even remember how much it was, but I just had this, like, single sachet that I had to rub on yeah. every day. Um, but at that time, I also was kind of concerned that when you do go on TRT, your natural levels reduce. So mm -hmm. your natural production just down regulates. Um, this is kind of very, a lot of people know this and this is you hear about the steroids and like the typical side effects of steroids mm -hmm. that people hear about. And so that was just like concern because I was like, well, I don't want to not be able to have children in future. I want to stay fertile. Um, and then also because obviously I was watching 3DMJ, I was watching Matt Ogus, I was like, oh, this natural bodybuilding thing. This is something that's very exciting. This is kind of something right. I've been doing. I can't compete if I'm taking kind of testosterone replacement therapy. That's effective. That's a banned substance for sure. Yeah. So I asked my doctor if I could trial coming off. He actually, to my surprise now, because I'm, I'm recovered and I've been off for like over seven years almost, he wasn't um, expecting me to be able to sustain kind of healthy, normal levels. Really? But I could. Um, they were low. They were in the low range, but I still was able to maintain body hair. I had good energy levels. I had somewhat a libido. It was nothing like when I was on it. Um, right. Like it was. Some of it was almost too much. Like the libido. Like some of the libido side was too yeah. much. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it got a bit too much. But um, so yeah, and then it all kind of went from there. And I contacted a load of uh, all the UK federations. Um, out of them, two of them came back and said I could compete with a doctor's note and kind of evidence that I'd never kind of taken more than what was required for my normal health and I could pass polygraphs. Um, and I competed because I, I really wanted to just prove to myself that I was fully better from everything. So if I could go get shredded on a bodybuilding stage, like I've come from ground zero, like so such in a bad state and built myself mm -hmm. up and I kind of wanted to just prove myself that I was fully recovered from it because I don't know, you, whenever you've had something bad like that happen to you, it always kind of 
has a shadow following you and you're never quite sure, sure if you're okay or anything like that. So yeah. um, I got a coach uh, who seemed to know his stuff and I was 190 pounds and cut all the way down to um, 160 pounds kind of want in one straight go, uh, which isn't crazy, crazy, but it was really hard. And I was completely yeah. ignorant to what it took to get like shredded glutes. And yeah. uh, I completely was unaware of things like non-energy activity thermogenesis. So I was just like being a lazy slob and not losing weight and wondering why. Um, yeah. And doing tons of cardio to make up for that fact. So uh, I managed to place in two of the novice shows that I did. Um, yeah. And... After that, and during that time, I was also transitioning into becoming a personal trainer. And I start, I was in an office job at the beginning um, when I came out of university. And I then transitioned because I was like, it's becoming more and more obvious fitness is my passion mm -hmm. and what I want to do. So I was one-on-one -on -one PTing as I competed. And during that time in that gym, people were seeing kind of me get more and more shredded. It was more of the younger students that were in that gym who were kind of like, I don't want you to take me for a session. I want you to do my nutrition and training programming. Um, so I did that with people and I built myself to a point where kind of the online business and I'd seen 3DMJ doing it. So I was like, that seems really cool. So I kind of wanted to push that. And also being contest prep, I was being super lazy, sitting behind a laptop seemed quite nice compared to mm -hmm. taking people through sessions. Yeah. So um, that kind of transpired into Revive, Revive with Stephen Hall grew actually. It wasn't Revive Stronger at the time. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, it all basically, that's the, the story behind where my accident took me and then where I came to. Uh, and it was a really kind of horrible time, but I don't think I'd take it back because it's kind of, I can attribute a lot of that and a lot of the, the skills I developed during that time to have helped me and get me where I am today. Um, right. And I couldn't be happier with where I am right now. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I guess, quite a long story. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that was probably, good, man. That was... I probably went over some of the things that happened, but uh, that's, yeah, an overview at least. <laughs> no, that was good. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of great points there. And I think, um, you know, having gone through the health issues there, and I think anybody who's gone through serious health issues can relate to that and know that, like you said, it kind of sticks around, you know, you're always kind of wonder, I think it just makes you a little less sure of yourself. And like, you kind of realize like, I can break, you know, and things can happen. Um, and like you said, it just kind of sticks with you. And, and maybe that's part of the reason why you, you want to stay natural is you realize like, you know, things happen, and you're not always going to be healthy. And so, you know, obviously, we're all focused on fat loss and muscle gain. But at the end of the day, if you don't have your health, then it, it all kind of becomes irrelevant. So yeah, it makes you when you have something like that happen to you, it just makes you appreciate life so much more mm -hmm. because you realize it can be taken away from you at any moment. And it's much like an injury in the gym. A lot of guys, they get injured in the gym and then they learn that yeah. they should have some fatigue management. <laughs> so it's very much like, well, I could, life could be taken away at any point. Let's make the most out of this time. Right. Yeah, totally. And uh, definitely as hard as you said with like 3DMJ and all those guys, I mean, I think they did a great service to the industry because honestly prior to them much of the fitness industry and, and why i kind of you know like i said i've been doing this since i was 12 but i kind of stayed behind the scenes because the whole industry was kind of anathema to me like i would see it and there was just so much nonsense and it's just everything out there i mean not everything there were some good people out there but a lot of it was just bs or you know i guess like the fake natties if you want to call it that and yeah. all that stuff it just made it very hard to kind of find good information. And so a lot of those guys did a good job. And, and now you're obviously doing the same thing with your podcast, getting that out there. Do you remember um, Scooby at all? Did you ever see oh, his yeah, stuff? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know too much about what happened to him. He kind of like fell off the map. Something happened. but I just remember his hat and his shirt. Yes. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I remember his homemade protein bars. That's about all I can remember from Scooby. Yeah, he was one of like the OG guys. Yeah, yeah. he was one of the beginners. Um, and actually, and that's how I came across you was, you know, I saw your podcast and I think this was probably about a year ago. Um, I cool. saw it and you like actually what happened with you and Omar Yusuf, um, with both of you guys, I saw the channel and, you know, I kind of had the, that mentality of like, well, these guys are newer than I am. Why am I going to watch their stuff? You know, like when you're, I mean, again, especially for Omar, cause this was when he first came in, I don't know, it's been a while now. 
But then as I watch more and more of the content, I'm like, okay, no, actually, this guy's got a lot of really good stuff, and he's, like, doing good work, and he's bringing good people on. Um, and then I think I messaged you about the comment you had where you had said people, you know, and again, this is probably close to a year ago, where you had said people might see you and think, like, you know, you're not big enough or something like that. And your response was, like, you don't even know me. Like, you don't know anything about me. And I definitely related to that because, you know, as we know, genetics are a huge part of this. And there are some guys who are amazing coaches or even amazing lifters who aren't that big or super strong, but they're very knowledgeable. And, of course, we see the opposite, too. And, and I remember yeah. you saying that a lot of people related to that video when you said that because, I mean, inherently, we do tend to judge one's knowledge, you know, on how they look. And yeah. it kind of takes a moment to step back and realize that that might not be at least not the only thing. Of course, if somebody's just, you know, completely overweight and, un, you know, completely unimpressive, something's going on there. But, you know, due to the amount of genetics, I think a lot of people related to what you said there. Yeah, I think it's it's difficult because there's genetics and then also environment. So mm -hmm. some people like I remember Matt Ogus or using him as an example because we've spoken about him. He was making his living basically through filming his workouts, filming his nutrition and being on YouTube. And it's kind of like, well, he could maximize so much in terms of like getting the most out of his genetics and putting in everything. And he had a, he had like tutorship from Eric Helms and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he was going to get great results. Whereas obviously there's other people who, I mean, you're a dentist, you have like obligations outside of that, which I'm sure are quite pressured. And like other people have family and kids or like other things. We've both gone through kind of issues with our health that impact our kind of ability to do our best. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really hard. You can't really judge a book by its cover in that sense because yeah, there's guys who have great bodies despite what they do, not because of what they do. Like right, there's right. so many examples of that. <laughs> Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I think we all do it. You know, we all kind of, when we see somebody who's kind of smaller, we, we wonder, well, what, what can they tell me? But yeah. again, once you, you think about it, you realize the truth out there. So yeah. now it seems like you've worked pretty closely with Mike Israel. I was just curious, did you ever hire him or did you just talk to him a lot? I know you've had him on your show a lot. Yeah. So I, um, so he's never coached me. Uh, okay. If he would coach, he'd be like, I'd want him to coach me. Yeah. Um, he, if anything, I can kind of consult with him and we can have chats. So he's definitely in many ways kind of mentored me without mm -hmm. officially doing so. I was just lucky to have found him when he wasn't that big. Right. And we've really had kind of a bit of a symbiotic relationship because he was, he's always, he had a bigger presence in the industry than I did at the time. But through me kind of having him on the show, through doing seminars with him, I think we both really benefit out of it. And now we have a really nice relationship where if I have a question, I can go to him. If he needs help, I don't know, pushing something, I can have a conversation about how we can do that. Uh, so yeah, he's never, I've only ever, I haven't been coached by either him or Jared, but I've consulted with both of them um, and okay. Roderick Chavez of, as well, who is Mike's coach. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, I've seen you have, I haven't seen too many of your videos of Broderick, but I've seen that you have a lot of them. They're on my watch later list. So I'll yeah, he, <laughs> he's a character and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll enjoy those, I think. Cool. So how similar is your training, would you say, to what Mike ascribes to? Because I do see a contrast between Mike's point of view and, um, you know, like Eric Helms and Lane Norton, yeah. mostly in terms of the MRV and MEV and all that stuff. Um, my experience with it, and eventually I'm going to be talking with Mike, and I, I want to, you know, hear him one on one too. But a lot of these other guys, they don't seem to necessarily ascribe to how systematic he makes it. If that makes sense. Yeah. So in your training, and when you train other people, you know, how do you apply it? So um, I do. I, I I don't know how to say this. I uh, I always feel bad about it because I feel like people expect me to have a very similar approach to Mike. And mm. having said that, you might think, oh, he's not going to have a similar approach. But I do, because okay. I listen to Mike. I've spoken to him I've spoken to him for like hours on the podcast, but even in person, we've had discussions. And I find it very obvious that his goal in life, and this is like optimization wise, is to maximize hypertrophy. And that is like his absolute passion without a shadow yeah. of a doubt. So I know from his understanding that he really, that's what he wants. And he's incredibly smart. 
when you hear him talk, he can talk about anything forever. So mm-hmm. there's a few things like helping him along. I just, I know he's an incredibly intelligent guy. I know he's, he's not dogmatic in any sort of sense of the word. His actual goal is for the best outcomes possible. Not that the other guys aren't, but I know Mike is. And then when I hear his arguments, I find it very hard to counter them. And they often actually, when he uses them and references them, they fall with how I've experienced things. So I, obviously I said my early influences were 3DMJ and uh, Matt Ogus and everything. And much of my early training was using an approach like their own. Mm-hmm. And I got to a point where it worked really well, but I got to a point where it was not producing the results I wanted to. And I almost felt a little bit lost. And something I absolutely love Mike for is the systematic approach that he has, like you mentioned, where mm-hmm. he has phases where you can't just infinitely bulk forever. You actually know you've got a chunk of time where you need to maximize growth and then you're going to pull back for a period of time and then you're going to go again. And not only did this help me, but it also helped my clients a massive load because we could just periodize long term. And whether or not it's 100% the kind of theoretical and the, the practice that Mike's putting in or whether it's just because now I know I've only got chunks of time to do things, I'm just much more on it. I don't know exactly, but whatever it is, the approach that I've been taking since following uh, Mike's kind of ideologies has expedited my results. It's made me enjoy training much more and furthered my understanding uh, for myself and clients. The biggest thing I take away is kind of, I think a lot of people, and I I misunderstood it at first with Mike in that I just thought more was better and that's Mm -hmm. kind of how I was taking things. Once I started dialing things back, And I really set myself up from my foundational week and then progress things from there, making sure that first week was incredibly high quality. Results started flying in. Uh, So, yeah, I I train very similar to the way Mike suggests because I've tried it and it works super well. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I've seen some of your progress pictures. And honestly, it's it's impressive to me because you've been doing this for a while. I don't know how many years. I mean, from as far as serious lifting, how many years are you in now? So I always find this a little bit tricky to uh, I mean serious lifting so after my accident I probably start that's when I started getting serious so 21 um, but I did lift from the age of 15 um, and then obviously I kind of didn't know what I was doing and then had the accident so I kind of th- those years I don't think are particularly great so yeah 21 so okay I'm 28 now okay all right yeah I mean so you're still in a window where obviously the gains are slowing but you can probably still eke some out and I mean you're what 195 right now uh, I'm at about 190. I'm mini cutting, so I'm okay. slowly shrinking. Barbie, yeah. I'm hoping to hit 200 early next year. Well, not early next year. Next year, we'll hit 200. I've said okay. it. Before <laughs> I even do another contest, you think? Uh, I'm Yeah, next contest is probably 2020 uh, because okay. my feedback when I first competed was more size. The feedback when next time I competed was more size. Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy to have placed in two British finals but I want to be able to look competitive to win those. Um, I don't just want to be someone who would contend. I want to be like, that guy looks like he could win. So So how many contests so far now? Uh, So I've only competed two seasons, but in my first season I did two. And then, yeah, last season just gone, I did four. Oh, wow. Okay. So you were 160 and then how much? uh, I was 165 to uh, 165. just over 165, depending how okay. my carb load kind of went <laughs> and mm-hmm. which. Yeah. So. Do you have a goal weight for this one? Or are you just going to try to come in leaner or any specific plan there? For 2020, I yeah, I will still be a middleweight because I'm pretty much with that way in. I'm in the middle of that class, so I'll okay. still be a middleweight. But I'd love to be, I mean, I, I don't have a goal, but I'd love to be like five pounds heavier. I think I need yeah. about five pounds to be competitive because yeah. there's guys who are just in the weight category who are shorter than me right. and they're just as lean. So it's kind of like, right, I need to yeah, compete so. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, so in 2020, we got the comebacks for Phil Heath, Flex Lewis, and Steve Hall. It's a big <laughs> year. <laughs> so let's see. Um, you had a book that you wrote, right? An ebook called right, Get yeah. Big, Stay Lean. Is that right? Yeah. And you know, what was your process with writing that? Because I know for me, I... You know, I started writing a book and it's still there, but one of the things, and you and I are both very evidence-based, and 
there's so much evidence constantly coming out that it's hard to keep up with it. And I would write something and then a new study would come out. So how did you balance that in writing that? So I wrote that um, in when I was in my contest prep, actually, in 2014. Sorry, my phone's going off. No worries. She's going to be, she's going to hate me now. It's my girlfriend. That's the second time I've recorded a <laughs> podcast today and I've had to turn her down because I'm recording. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in 2014 is when I actually wrote that book, um, because it was basically, I wrote it as a bit of a, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I was 21 years old and I was like, I want to get into this online business stuff. I'm going to like mm-hmm. try and write this book, uh, because there's guys in my gym who I think would benefit from reading it. And it was kind of like, I'd see, there's a lot of people around that time who are thinking, ah, oh, like, I don't know what to, they're like intermediates who are thinking about taking steroids because they didn't know how to track macros. They didn't know mm-hmm. what progressive overload was. They didn't have any sort of idea of how to actually go about things. They were just like, eat big to get big, train hard. Mm-hmm. And that's only gets you so far. So I, that's what get big, stay lean was, was a plan to do that, but whilst staying lean, obviously. Um, and I used kind of sources from my learnings from Lar McDonald, from um, Eric Helms, 3DMJ, and kind of came together with this book. And it wasn't, the the reason it, I still sell it today and I'm still fine to sell it is because a lot of the things in there were like just basics. It's mm-hmm. not kind of, I don't go too far into the new learnings that I've got now. And we are actually working on doing a part, like a, a new one, a new addition to that because okay. it's just cool. so much more information now out there. So yeah, the reason that book is still kind of relevant and people have asked me about it is because it isn't too kind of crazy and elaborate. It is for that early intermediate who just mm-hmm. needs that next level of understanding of what are calories, why do we need so many, how many should I be eating, protein, etc., how much to have, sure. um, and that sort of stuff. That found those basic foundational ba- like things don't change so much. So, uh, sure. yeah, that's kind of where that stemmed from. Cool. And how big is the Revive Stronger team at this point? I know we've got you and Pascal. Is anybody else included? I, I think your earlier interviews you were doing it with somebody else, I believe. Yes. So, um, yeah, this was a bit of a Basically, one, I was looking to expand and bring on another uh, coach for a time. I don't really, I, I can't, thinking back to it, I don't really know why. Because at the time, it wasn't like I was huge. I think, mm-hmm. I, what, I think thinking about it now is I miss having colleagues. I, re- I still miss it to this day. And I love having Pascal to work with because I kind of get that. But obviously, he's over in Germany and I'm in the UK. Mm-hmm. So it's not quite the same. But I miss having colleagues. So... I was looking to bring on a coach and Mark Newcomb was the guy. Um, and basically we just chatted a bit off air and he was a super nice guy, really down to earth. Um, and so I wanted to help him because he was kind of struggling in the online scene and a bit with his PT stuff. So, um, I wanted to bring him on as a coach. Unfortunately, um, life commitments for him. He's had like a few children since then and yeah. all of these sort of things happened where he couldn't commit to doing it. So I had to let him go. And then that led to an opportunity to bring on more coaches. And I, at the time, I was thinking to bring on three. Um, but that didn't happen in the end because I was just too nervous to. Um, and I think it probably was uh, not probably. It was certainly the best decision to make to have just brought Pascal on. But I did a yeah. whole – I remember doing a whole um, post on Facebook. And it was actually incredibly humbling to have like 50, 50 and most of them pretty good coaches apply and – Oh, wow. through their paces, doing kind of that to do a, a certain number of different tasks for me. And then I interviewed them. Um, but yeah, I interviewed Pascal first because he'd flown through the ranks and I gave him the job there and then. Uh, oh, wow. So <laughs> I wasn't intending to do that, but it just all went so well. So at the moment, it's just me, Pascal. But we recently brought on Miguel, um, who, again, I don't know if you know Miguel Blacou, um, or Blacou. I don't know him, no. Um, but he's he's currently studying towards a Ph.D., he, but in his own words, he wants to be the next Eric Helms. Um, <laughs> incredibly book smart, just like he, he wants, and this is like his goal. He's very, very sure of it. He wants to be able to like reference studies off the top of his head, just put them out there. He isn't kind of, I don't think he has massive bodybuilding aspirations or massive like physique aspirations. It's more so he wants to be like the next Eric Helms and be awesome. incredibly kind of big in that arena. And I will, again, he, approached us and we weren't intending to bring anyone on but it was kind of like it was a mutual benefit there and he fit with the brand really well so yeah it's just Miguel me but me and Pascal are kind of like um 
partners and then Miguel as a coach. Very cool. Very cool. So what's the, the future, I guess, of Revive Stronger? I mean, you kind of went into it, but do you have any you know, big goals for your, uh, your company there? So I, my goal has always been to, I really want to open a gym, but it's going to be oh, incredibly really? difficult to do that. Uh, I'd love yeah. to have a premises of some sort. Mm. That'd be really cool. Um, but for us, it's, I want to, as a business, I want to help more people and I also want to have more freedom. So I think that means I need to, and we need to develop more, um, I forget what the term is, kind of income streams that don't rely on our time so much. Uh, because at the moment, our main income source is client work and we can only handle a certain number of clients before sure. quality just you know, takes a, takes mm -hmm. a downturn. So we've kind of capped to that and we need to now work on projects to help in other areas. So that's why we're thinking about the eBooks, trying to produce those, working with other, other people. Um, if you know Jacob Skeppus uh, from J the name. JPS Fitness, actually, this is the brand uh, wearing his, his uh, vest. He's doing a mentorship program and we're uh, part of the mentorship team on there. So yeah, finding some other ways to make, um, make a, a living via, and having more freedom and time via other sources other than coaching. I still love coaching. I always want to be able to do that, but I'd love to be able to have a little bit more freedom. Um, and yeah, it's just finding the right balance for that. I don't have it. And the overall goal was actually always to be the uh, Europe's answer to 3DMJ because obviously 3DMJ <laughs> are American based. We wanted to be Europe's yeah. answer for that. So that is always awesome. kind of, yeah, my, my overriding dream from the start. <laughs> Oh, very cool, man. Yeah, I mean, a lot of respect for you there because it's tough, as you obviously know, to make enough money to really like sustain yourself in this industry. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to not need the fitness industry for my income. And I, I get to do it just kind of because I enjoy it. Nice. Um, but everybody I know who's opened a gym, especially if, you know, they're just it's a kind of lone gym, you know, not like a chain or anything. It's obviously very hard to sustain. Yeah. Um, and like you said, you risk losing quality when you try to take on too many people. And you run into a lot of issues with that. So, I mean, so far, you're obviously doing a great job with it. So, you know, good luck well, with your future that. endeavors. Um, so, last question here is I like to end on kind of an actionable step. So, for people watching this and, uh, you know, they're taking a lot in, maybe they're where we were where they're going through some health issues and they're you're just trying to really get into fitness. What's your next actionable step for those people? So, they're just trying to get into it. Um, I think my first step would be, I mean, if they have a basis of education and knowledge, which I assume they do if they're listening to this, I would just say go and do it and stick to it and be consistent. Something that's helped me a lot tremendously is I am a very consistent person uh, with the podcast when that first, I mean, you'll see podcasts come and go. Uh, there's a lot now within the industry and um, they do an episode kind of every week for a month and then there'll be nothing for like, mm -hmm. I don't know, six months. Um, but we've managed to release an episode every single week for like ever since the podcast has started running. Uh, so things like that matter. So mm -hmm. with your training, don't worry if it's optimal. Don't worry if your nutrition's optimal. If it's good, it's got foundational basic principles correct. Go and do it. Be consistent and then kind of assess and analyze later. Don't stress about it because I think a lot of overthinking and paralysis. Par Para, I forgot what it's called. Paralysis by analysis. Is that what it's called? Oh, yeah. Paralysis uh, by analysis. Paralysis. That's the word. Paralysis. <laughs> paralysis. Paralysis by analysis um, holds a lot of people back. And I hate seeing that. Um, so I much prefer people just to take action um, once they've got a decent grounding of knowledge. You don't need to know it all. Awesome. Awesome. Man. So people can find you. You're on Instagram. You're on YouTube. You have a Revive Stronger Facebook group. Yep. Anywhere else? Um, no, I think you mentioned the net main ones. Obviously, the YouTube podcast is also on kind of podcast providers, so it's on iTunes yeah, okay. and things like that. Uh, but yeah, the website um, and yeah, people want to contact me directly. Probably Instagram is the best place. I I love Instagram. I'm very mm -hmm. active on there. Um, and then yeah, we have the private, not private, yeah, closed Facebook group um, where people can join. They just have to answer some small questions, like yeah, that are really easy to answer, and they can get in there. Cool. All right, man. Well, thanks for talking with us. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Steve Hall, getting some of his background in this and seeing him on the other side of the podcast. I think he has a lot to share, especially after talking with so many knowledgeable people in this field. 
If you like the video and you want to see more like this, please subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and comment down below on other topics you'd like us to cover. And if you like the charity that we're donating to today, please feel free to make your own donation as well.